Two, two more scriptures left, um, and we will have finished the whole Bible in four sessions. <laughs> yeah, where have I been? What are you talking about? <laughs> All right, First Peter chapter 1. Isn't it interesting that a whole lot of these scriptures we've been reading are like within the first chapter and the first part of the first chapter? And they're, they start off warning you. <laughs> All right. First Peter 1, let's start at verse uh, 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold trials, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> All right. Um, the first thing to notice in verse 6 is, uh, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you, you are in heaviness. And the word heaviness, if you look it up, basically is the word depression. Through manifold trials. All right. We as Christian, modern day Christians would say, no one should ever be depressed. Well, if that's true, we're sure failing because there's a whole lot of depression among Christians. Um, and yet this is saying, uh, the wording, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a season you're not greatly rejoicing, you might be in depression for a while. You rejoice in the reality of it, but at this moment, you may be going through manifold trials that are um, bringing you down. It's almost a sin to admit that in modern day <laughs> Christian circles that, that, you know, people walk up, well, you know, just think of going to church on Sunday morning and some of the some of the churches, you walk in the door, how you doing? You know, you dare not say, you know, I'm having a real problem right now, but I'm with the Lord. Oh, no, no, no. You don't need to be having problems. We'll fix that right now. We'll chase that off. Though, if need be, if need be, he's saying, if it's necessary for you to be going through this, not just the trial, but the, you know, the effect that it's having on you, <clears throat> then, um, then okay, then it's okay. Um, because ultimately it's the trial of your faith. And notice the, the way that this is. The trial of your faith, it is not your faith, but the trial of your faith. Verse 7. I just don't think we as Christians read the Bible all the way through. It's like we, 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 we have concepts that we've been taught, and those concepts keep us from reading the Bible as it is written. You know, and Jesus, a lot of times, you know, I believe he had to face that too, and that's why a lot of times when he's teaching, he would say, da 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 da, -da as it is written. <laughs> because, folks, we don't need a Christianity that is contrary to as it is written. We need the Word of God. Well, we need the Scripture, and then from the Scriptures, we need the Holy Spirit to, to reveal, as it were, the Word of God, God's heart, God's reality. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith is more precious than gold, though it be tried with fire. All right, <clears throat> so I'm picturing... An altar. I'm picturing Israel and them all offering, and I'm picturing them um, I'm picturing them throwing a dead lamb up on the altar and just going, well, that's it. That's all we need. It's all God wants. Well, no, he wants the fire to come down on it and consume it. Right? He doesn't just want something dead. He wants 
it in a spirit of faith death that he can accept, that he can consume. When I say consume, that's, you know, what is that song? And it comes from the verses in Hebrews, all consuming fire, <clears throat> you know, and uh, uh, our God is a consuming fire. And we go, oh, no, oh, no, he's a consuming fire. <clears throat> no, no, that's, that's good. It means he accepts you. You know, in that, in that context, it means that you're accepted. It's when fire doesn't fall from heaven on the sacrifice that you should worry. You know, like, like, like Hebrews 12, where it talks about chastisement and stuff. It says, hey, be worried if you're not chastised. You know, clearly you're a son if you're being chastised. You are in the family. You are of God. But if you're not, if there's not some sort of fire, if there's not some sort of a dealing, if there's not that, and, and in the case we were talking about first, the acceptance by God of the sacrifice. Now your faith is accepted because it's had fire applied to it. All right. <clears throat> so we can take that a lot of different directions. But one thing that you can't miss in this is that... Um, that he says that the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. And though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord. And <clears throat> this word appearing, you have to look it up, but the word appearing there is not your, not, there's a particular word that it uses a lot in the Greek that simply means that Christ is manifested. We, every time it's translated appearing or something, we go, oh, that's when he comes back in the clouds. But, but there are different words used for appearing and revealing. Um, and if you really understand those words, then you can begin to see uh, this particular situation. He's wanting Christ manifested through all of this, not just showing up somewhere in some clouds, you know. And, and really, what good is... Him showing up in clouds if we're not really being conformed to his image. I'm just saying. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's like <laughs> we used to have a bumper sticker in the 60s. And, it <laughs> and uh, you know, us Jesus freaks. And it said in big letters on the bumper sticker, Jesus is coming. And in little letters it says, and boy, is he pissed. <laughs> <clears throat> And in Ireland, sorry, that's a different word, but it means he's upset. It doesn't mean he's drunk. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, let's go to um, Matthew 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. But we Jesus freaks really like that bumper sticker for this reason. Everybody would, kind of the way you said it, I mean, everybody's like, oh, yay, Jesus is coming. We're kind of going, you know, you might ought to rethink that, the way, <laughs> the way some of you are living. <laughs> okay, what did I say, Matthew 5? Did I say verse 11? Okay, 11 and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Praise God, amen. How many of you just, yeah, this is what I've been looking for, you know. <laughs> you filthy, slimy dog, you scum-sucking pig. You go, glory to God, yeah, you know. Um, <clears throat> there is a place in the Lord when these things are coming down on us because of the Lord, that it is a glorious thing, but you have to, and so I'm not explaining, I'm just stating, you have to comprehend your fellowship with him in his sufferings, and you have to comprehend the glory of the cross, not the shame of the cross. Okay, 
And there is shame, but who for the shame, he still went through it. You know, for the glory that was set before him, endured the shame and all that kind of stuff. There is a, a glory in this thing uh, that brings glory to the Father, and that is the extreme selflessness of Christ for others. An extreme self-giving. Okay. Why is that glorious? Because nobody but him is that way. And those that are joined to him, conformed to him, see the reality of that. And so, again, we're just going to kick and scream and, you know, fight what God's trying to do. And, and you know, we say, oh, God, I want to see your glory. He goes, okay, so let's bring, bring him to the cross. <laughs> And we go, no, no, I want to, you know, because most churches, when they say, I want to see, I want to see the glory of God, they're saying, I want to be happy and jump up and down, and I want everybody really just going, woohoo, you know, and that, we just saw the glory of God. <clears throat> well, it may have been glorious, but it wasn't the glory of God. There's a difference between something being glorious and God's glory. God's glory. I'm not going to explain it, but God's glory is not just having a glorious worship service. <clears throat> Especially when everybody in that worship service is only concentrating on what makes them happy. No, I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen worship services, and I've seen people go, oh, you know, yeah, yes. And, and then I talked to them afterwards, and they'd go, you know, that was the best service ever. And I go, really? Why? Oh, man, I just felt so good. I felt so close to God. I felt, I felt, I, me, I. And were, were we giving glory to God? Oh, yeah. But were we? Were we? When the focus is back on ourselves, there's no glory. That's just good old-fashioned selfishness, you know. <clears throat> Jesus came and he glorified the Father. But he was the express image of God, so the way that he glorified the Father was he manifested him. He says, he says the works that I do are not my own. It's not about me. Doug, Doug called me today and <clears throat> we were talking and, and uh, he said, he, we always share the word and it's just in us and he they said, yeah, when Jesus said, not my will be done, we always think, you know, well, Jesus had a different will than the Father, and he's going, okay, I ain't going with my, my bad will. I'm going to go with your will, you know. <clears throat> and, of course, Jesus was the Son of God. He had the same exact will as the Father because they're one. They're one. It's one God. And so he had the same exact will. So then we go, well, if he had the same exact will, why would he say, not my will? <clears throat> And, and, um, Doug, and, of course, some of you have heard me share on this before, but Doug said uh, that very simply, Jesus is just saying, look, not my will, not my will. I live by you, Father, you know. And the way that I saw it was the same thing, just said a little different way. I saw it as Jesus saying, Father, even though my will is exactly the same as yours, I don't want to go by me. I want to go by you, not my will. Thine be done. Well, that's getting into, that's cutting the bread pretty thin, isn't it? In the sense that, <clears throat> you know, Jesus is, doesn't have a rank will. It wants to, you know, and, he, you know, he said, if it be possible, But he'd already said, the Father hath given me a commandment that I can take my life or I can lay it down, that he gave me that choice. So I can imagine the Father even saying to Jesus, okay, I'm calling the whole thing off. And Jesus going, no, no, you said I could choose. I choose your will. I choose your path. And... <clears throat> You know, a lot of times we're working so hard to get our will 
lined up with God's. Instead of just saying, not my will, whatever it is. You know, you know one day you say, my will is totally the opposite of yours, not my will, but thine be done. The next day it is, I want to, you know, I want to do this thing too that you want me to do, but I'm going to do it because you want it, not because I want it. You know. <clears throat> you say, well, what's, you know, I mean, you know, that's where people think, well, what is the difference? Why? You sound like you're splitting hairs. It's all the difference in the world. It's the difference of a of of a nature of nature. It's the difference of the having and functioning by the divine nature, as Peter talks about, or just becoming Christians that line up as best as we can with God. You know. Well, where is the Lord in it? Oh, he, he, uh, you know, he molded me to this point. You know. Well, have you ever read the thing in Jeremiah about the prophet? He was building it and everything, and he didn't like how it was done. He started all over and <laughs> built a whole nother vessel. The point was a vessel, not making us good, but making us a fit vessel for Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power won't be of us. The excellency of the will won't be my will lined up with God. That the excellency of the motives won't just be my motives. It will be Christ in me. And I will be, you know, remember what we said, the hidden life. We're talking about the hidden life. For you're dead, then your life is hid. Now you need to have that revealed. And you can hear me talk about it forever. And you're going to think you have it because you've heard it before. But it has to come by the Holy Spirit, and it has to be Christ revealed. In other words, it's as if you have to see the veil rent in the temple, not it written in the book and you read it. Okay, the veil was rent. What does that mean, you know? So, <clears throat> Certain things are hidden, and God wants to wants to draw us out into it. All right, so uh, what verse did I say, 11? Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil, all manner of evil. Do you have any clue what all manner of evil sounds like when people are talking about you? I would, I would assume it's not good. Except I would assume what they're saying is not good, but you're blessed. Blessed are you, right? All right, so <clears throat> we have to look at that. We have to just be real and say, I don't get it. I don't get it. I want to get it. I don't, I don't want to. The deal is when we read the word of God in our own flesh, we're going to freak out because we're not Jesus. And we're going to think that God's putting, you know, you ever heard that scripture, he'll not put more on you that you can handle? What's in the word? You know, he'll not put more on you than, uh, I may not be saying the exact words right, but basically he won't put more on you than, than you can handle. <clears throat> well, just saying love your brothers more than we can handle. Just saying pray for those who despitefully use me is more than I can handle. So, so, you know, and the picture that I always get is in the tabernacle, <clears throat> when you got to the, to the, get, the, the first door um, <clears throat> and stepped inside, it was the outer court, and the first thing you came to was the altar. And the first thing you always come to is the altar, for you are dead. There's no need talking about anything else in that tabernacle until you go to that altar. It always starts with the cross. It always starts with a real reality. And the glory in the Holy of Holies depends 
on that cross. Now we may, our flesh may rebel or say, I don't like this or don't preach the cross. Just, just, can we just go around the backside of the tabernacle and open a few tents, open a few sheets and shoot into the Holy of Holies from back there? Ooh, no, you'd be struck dead because you don't belong in there. By that time, the altar needs to have already enacted the removal of you. The goal was never to strike anybody dead in the Holy of Holies. The goal was they should have been dead back at the altar when they started. See. All right. <clears throat> and of course, who's the who's the great high priest? Jesus. He died at the altar. He died at the cross and then went in the Holy of Holies and he didn't get struck dead. <clears throat> but once you get past that, there's this thing called the laver, and it's like a big bowl made out of mirrors of the, of the women that were brass, brass mirrors that when you polish it, you can see <coughs> in it. And, and uh, the priest, after slaying the sacrifice, he may have spots and blemishes on him, and you don't want to go in there, you know, with spots and blemishes. And so he looks into this big mirror that they took all the women's, the, the women gave their mirror, their brass mirrors that they fixed themselves up in, and beat it into one big bowl and it was filled with water <clears throat> and he was able to look into the laver and see the different spots and blemishes that he had. Okay. <clears throat> Well, so far, that's nothing more than the law pointing out what's wrong with you. You know, the law points out what's wrong with you. It never gave any answers. It says, if you do this, then you'll be blessed. You do that, and you'll be cursed. Well, how do I do this? Forget it. If you just do it, you know what I mean? That never, the law doesn't give us answers as to how to do this thing. <clears throat> but Jesus does, and Jesus is that labor. So you look in there and you see the different spots and things, but there's the washing of the water of the word. And you can apply that. And, it, and you, that there together, that combination of being able to see what's wrong with you, but to wash, and the true washing, folks, is the cleansing away of everything that is not Christ. It is not just a cleaning us up, just like water baptism is not just a cleaning away of our sins. Water baptism is death, burial, and resurrection. It is our death, and when we come up out of that thing, we don't go, oh, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I, I just got baptized, you know, and I've seen that in many a water baptism. They're going, oh, I'm, I'm brand new. No, you're brand dead, you know? I mean, in reality, in reality, because there's no, and that's the beginning of Christianity. That's the first ordinance it's like the altar it's like the altar right there the first thing you have to do you gotta go to that altar christian first thing you have to do you need to go down into the water of death and and come back up and all of it you know it's it's the symbolism of the reality of christ and him crucified and our death with him <clears throat> and I've had many of people who, who didn't know that when they got baptized, and later they go, can I get rebaptized?" And I said, well, we can, you know. And the goal is that you understand what this meant. You don't just, you know, it's not about getting wet. You know, well, I got wet for God. You know, <laughs> it's, you know it's about I got, I got dead. You know, and Christ is my life. And you may, and a brand new Christian isn't living that yet, is he? There's no way that he can be living it that early, but he can acknowledge it. And that's what we do. And, and so that labor, man, you, there's no, you're not going to get to that thing until you've gone through the altar. And then God has the provision there. But the, and the labor, of course, represents the word of God. That if you, if you go to this word and you see you, you see everything that's wrong. It's like Pharisees pointing at you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That the, the scriptures are just condemning you. And you're going, oh, you know. And you, <clears throat> I 
I was reading and the Holy Spirit was sharing the meaning with me recently of the scripture where Jesus said, well, make the tree good. And, you know, your are old mind is, I'm, I'm trying to make it good, you know. And it's got a whole other meaning to it, you know. It's not, it, it can't be the law. We can't get there through the law. We can't get there through us. We can't get there by um, trying harder. You get there through the cross. And then once you go pass through the cross, then the labor means something because you see those spots. But the, the word is being applied to that, and it's washing you away and all that's left. Remember the scripture? It says uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says it's like beholding ourselves in a mirror is the actual word. Um, and, but it says there we see the face of Jesus, not us. In other words... It's like the labor, all of a sudden, you're not seeing you, you see Jesus. It's like the word of God. Now I'm not being condemned by seeing me and what's wrong with me. I see how this applies to Christ. But the first step to, to making that change is you have to see the cross in light of your death. Because everything that proceeds after that is not going to apply to you. And the, and, but if you do, if you do see the death, then you go to the Word, and then you begin to, and that's, um, um, James talks about it. He says, we go to the Word and we forget what manner of man we are. Well, I'll tell you what manner of man we are. If we're seeing us, we're not a very good manner of man. We need more manners. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not, we are not fit proceed any further <clears throat> but our high priest didn't just go in there for us he did there are several trips a bunch of trips a lot of people don't know that in the day of atonement he made a lot of trips in there they don't know it they go they think there's one trip he made a trip for himself and then he made a trip for us and <clears throat> um and they don't realize that in the second trip, he began to take us into that with him. And we entered in by him, with him, in him. And that everything that happens now that acknowledges you only acknowledges you in him. And it does not include you outside of him or outside of the cross. And it does not, you know does not allow for um, um, you know just it doesn't allow for us under the law it doesn't allow for us under the law there's no condemnation in Christ not by Christ you know now that I'm a Christian or now that I whatever now he's not going to condemn me he will condemn you you are condemned apart from him Maybe you don't realize that. Somebody says, well, I'll stand before God. Are you going to stand before God without being found in him as your righteousness? Good luck. This is not a good picture, you know. <clears throat> and so uh, to proceed past the altar is to start proceeding into the depth of who he is until finally all that has taken place has only brought you to one point this veil and here here this veil is going to bring you into a comprehension of something that happened back at the altar that is incredible it's not just the death of sin not, not just the death of the old man here that veil it says in Hebrews we enter in through the rent veil his flesh Okay, okay. We're, we're going to have to comprehend his death in a different light now, a, a death that brings us in. And it's, there's a whole lot to this. There's a whole, whole lot to this. <clears throat> but that's, but, but you, it's a picture and a reminder that you never leave the cross. 
You know, I've had people tell me, oh, Brother Andy, all you ever do is talk about the cross. When are we going to get to the resurrection? Or, you know, I, you know, I just live in the resurrection and the cross is behind me. No. If the cross is behind you, then your understanding of the cross is that you got up there, died, and then he <laughs> raised you up. And you're getting to go now. You're, you're continuing past the cross. And there is no continuance past the cross except Christ. Christ. And that's good news to people who, who uh, have no, that have failed, that have no righteousness of their own, that realize there is no hope for me unless I choose this Jesus. There's no hope for me. To the righteous Pharisee, it's foolishness. What are you talking about? We're all, you know, and they fought for it. They said to Jesus, well, Moses told us that da-da-da-da, you know what I mean? And uh, <clears throat> even like the stoning of the, of the woman caught in adultery, well, Moses said so-and-so, so-and-so. And they knew that if he went against Moses, that's going to bring, you know, all hell down on his head. And so... He just did, instead of dealing with Moses, he dealt with human nature to reveal it for what it is. And then we will look within and go, you know what, we're all, you know. And so he says, you who are without sin, you know, you throw the first stone. You cast the first stone. Well, Moses would have said, Stone her, she did something wrong. Okay? And we deserve to die, folks, but not that death. We need the death of the cross. And people that resist the, the preaching of the cross like this, they have no clue what, what they're bringing themselves into. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, th they're, they're going to have to face stoning then, if you will. You know, and if you remember at Mount Sinai, I mean, there was spears and stones and loud horns and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they're going to get all of that. They're going to get uh, run through with a javelin and stoned and everything else because they stand alone without him. Okay. Well, I don't want to accept, I don't want to accept the, your death, your teaching on death. Jesus is life. Okay. But you will face death. You either face it in him or you face it without him. You will face death. <clears throat> I was thinking of, today I was thinking about Jesus when um, they said, you know, Lazarus is sick and, you know, hurry, you know, so he doesn't die. And so Jesus waited three more days until he heard he was dead, and then he came. And, and he came there, and Martha's going, you know, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, I told you. If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. And I realized that there were a lot of people there that saw a man raised from the dead. But who among them saw Jesus as the resurrection? Remember, he said, I am the resurrection. Who saw the glory of God? And the glory of God, folks, the glory of God is a death that God will raise you out of because of the quality of your death. I hope you all understand that. But it is. That's where the glory of God is in the death, and he glorifies it. I told you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Lazarus, if he got raised, he got raised for either, either because uh, Jesus was his friend or Martha talked him into it, or <clears throat> you understand, he got raised not out of a glorious death. There was no glory. 
So from it, they had, if they were going to see the glory of God, they're going to have to comprehend as Christ as the resurrection and God as the one who raised him out of a glorious dead. Because there is no resurrection for just, because I, I went down to an altar and said a little prayer. There's only a resurrection in and by Christ. That's it. There is. I, I'm telling you, there is. That, that's the only, that is the only resurrection. And that's the only death that God raises out of. Okay. So, so we're, all, we're all resisting death while we set ourselves up for even worse death. We're here's what I mean. We're resisting the cross. We're resisting the teaching of the cross. We're resisting the, and not that anybody here is, but it, there is resistance, by the way. I'm sure you've never met it before. <clears throat> but we're, uh, and if you begin to comprehend it, we are resisting the glory of God. We're resisting the glory of God. We're resisting the nature of God because the glory of God is a selfless giving manifested in its greatest definition by the words Christ crucified. That is the nature of God. Okay. I don't want that. I, I wouldn't want that. I don't want to. I don't want to be like Jesus. I mean, that, you would never say that, but, you know, well, I'm the Antichrist. You'd never say that. <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. But that's what the Christ is. The Messiah, folks, it is Christ crucified, and, the, and the, the Greek word for Messiah is Christ. The Hebrew word is Messiah. It is Messiah crucified that Paul preached. Messiah crucified. Oh, no, no, I just, want, I just want a Messiah that's going to save me from everything. That was their view. That was their view. And they're looking for the Christ, but they don't even have the right definition of the Christ. You know. And so, so it is today. So it is today. And... Good-hearted people, in a certain sense, you can say, are like signing their own death certificate to be handled by, uh, to keep it in a better tone, handled by crossing a border at the foot of Mount Sinai when God said, you don't get near me or this is going to happen to you. Don't come to me without Jesus. Don't come to me through anything but Christ crucified. Or you will be run through. The, uh, the law demands it, you know. And yet I, I picture Moses, and I, was, I didn't get a chance to finish my little search. I guess I was, this was going to not a little searching today, but <clears throat> of Moses, uh, and I was reading a little bit and, and starting to try to get the picture of it. And it's like Moses is up there with God, but it's like the, the uh, and, and God gave him the law, but at the same time, he gave him the pattern for the tabernacle. At the same time, I got chill bumps, you know. Ooh, Holy Ghost chill bumps. But it's, it's incredible to me to see this is our God. He goes, okay, here. Keep this, do this, or, you know, and lays the law on him. Then he goes, okay, here, this lamb, he's going to die over and over and over and over and over again. F f national sins, individual sins, daily sins, uh, 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 the whole burnt offering two times a day forever. Lamb, 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 lamb. Yeah, you know, and it's like, okay, so you got, you got a choice. Either you do it or you find yourself connected to the lamb that's connected to the altar. See? 
I mean, you, you choose. And Moses is up there, and he's seeing God, so he's not really seeing the law like they are, because they're going, well, you know, just tell us what you want us to do. You know, he, Moses isn't up there going, tell me what you want me to do. He's looking, and it says he's like, you know, th there's this picture, and I, I, I can't remember the exact description, but there's this picture of God, and he's like this sapphire, this blue skies and and eternity stretching everywhere and Moses is right there with him and it's almost like everything under their feet from there down to the bottom of Sinai is the law <laughs> and Moses is totally unaware of the law he's just with God he's above it but you know before Abraham was, I, I am. And it's like, I'm with that. I am. I'm with the one that always is. And it shoots you across all the streams of all religions and all this kind of stuff. And, it, and you just start conforming to that that you're looking at. You just start conforming to Christ. And he brings you in, you know. And that was, the, what was it? Last Sunday night, I was trying to share when I met Jesus and what affected me. Not that he's, he saved a wretch like me, but that he took a wretch like me and he drew me to himself, eventually into himself. I can't fathom it. I can't fathom it. But he did, and I'm not going to reject it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to reject it. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, I don't know how we got off on this. How did I get off on all this, all this Jesus cross stuff? What is this? What's this got to do with our class? Mm -hmm. It's a distraction. It's a rabbit trail. Or is it? It's a lamb trail. I love it. It's a lamb trail. Folks, I just, I'll just end with this. There is so much good stuff in the tabernacle. Uh, and I'm, I'm just saying that because with the picture that we just saw, okay, here's the Ten Commandments. Here's the tabernacle. It's kind of like, which one do you really want to give yourself to? And in that tabernacle, everything speaks of Christ. We, oh, that's well, we started with the altar speaks of Christ, speaks of us being crucified with Christ. Not us crucified, us crucified with Christ. Yes. It's a big difference. Yes. You know. And then the laver, which is the word, but it's the living word, it's the washing word. It just takes me away and everything that would be me, and it just cleanses me with that which is fresh and clean instead of dirty and yucky like I am. And, and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going with levels of the cross in different ways. The, the candlestick, light it, it just burns itself up, but it's giving light to everyone else. There's your selfless giving right there, just giving itself away. The bread of life, well, you have to eat it. Well, it has to be, you know, where was it? It was seeds that could have brought forth, done all this stuff, but they were crushed up, crushed up, crushed up and molded and worked together and made into dough, not good enough yet, shoved into the fire, all the crushing, not good enough, you know, shoved into the fire and then brought out and then everyone masticates it, eats it, chews it and takes it into themselves and all of a sudden it's bread but it's nothing but seeds who all gave themselves together. Hallelujah. It's just on and on and on, and there's no, this is just barely touching the surface. Just, you know, Paul said, "Oh, the depth of the glory, both of the wisdom and you know, knowledge of the Lord. Oh my God, you know." I mean, I love that that, that he's just he's talking and he's sharing from the Word. You know, there in Romans, and 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 all of a sudden, everything he's writing in that letter to them, he just it just hits him, and he has to write down. Oh, Oh, the depth, you know what I mean? I mean, he's just overwhelmed with it. He's, it's, it's not the, well, I'm going to I'm gonna give you God's word here, you know. Read that. <laughs> no, he's, he's caught up in that cloud with God on top and experiencing the Lord. 
Father, we just ask you to continue to have mercy on us in the sense that you would open your word, and in opening your word, we would see Jesus. And when we see him, we'll be like him. When we see him, there will be no more resistance, no more fears of, of troubles and trials because we will handle them by the nature of the Lamb. We will not be overwhelmed. We will not be fearful. We will rejoice. But we'll do that not out of religion or duty because the Word says it, we, the Scripture says it, but we will do it because the living Word is at work in us to manifest Himself through us. Father, these things are too great for us, too wonderful for us, but you've brought us in and you've invited us to come and commune with you in fellowship. Fellowship with you in this broken bread and this poured out wine. Help us to see past rituals and ink on white paper and find your son. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're dismissed.